If you can imagine what it would have been like to be with Jesus during just one of his days, a day in the life of Jesus, what would it have been like? Well, we're going to look at one of those days today as we're studying the book of Luke and uh, just simply about Jesus and talking about Jesus and what he did, who he is, and what he should mean to us. A day in the life of Jesus. If you could uh, describe just one of your Sundays as a typical Sunday for you, what would it be like? Well, we get up, we get ready, we come to church, and we have either made some preparations for dinner or we go out to dinner, and then we have some family time in the afternoon, and we're just kind of a typical day. What's your typical day like? A typical day for Jesus, what would it have been like? And if we look at the events found in Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 31 and going through the end of the chapter, we see some amazing things that go on. Some things that Jesus did that uh, simply astounded the people because of his authority. We sang about that a moment ago. His authority coming from his throne, how that he's in charge. Well, we see that those people recognize that authority back then. I remember a time or two in, in school and, and listening to people uh, thinking about voices of authority and how people spoke, and, and people that would, when they would speak, it would just catch your mind, catch your authority, because of their authority, and that's what Jesus was like. I think of people like uh, an actor named James Earl Jones, his, his deep, booming voice, and, and, and how it just, uh, just permeates everything and catches your attention. Uh, Jesus was like that as well. Jesus, the one of authority. Well, we see some events that happen here, and let's just kind of kind of get a little update as to where we come from. Uh, Jesus had been in Nazareth. Remember, we studied last week how he'd been to Nazareth, and he got kicked out. Basically, they ran him out of town, said, we don't want you here, and they tried to kill him on the way out, but he slipped through them and uh, made his way some 25 miles uh, to the city of Capernaum, which is on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. And as Jesus has gone there, one of the events that happens after he gets there that's not recorded in Luke, he calls the, the uh, disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, to be following him as apostles. So that event happens, and then he shows up in Capernaum, and he is um, he's preaching and teaching. He goes in on the Sabbath day to uh, the... Uh, synagogue and tries to share the good news with them and we'll notice some things about that today. Uh, this is a, a picture of the Sea of Galilee and the city of Capernaum and uh, the synagogue is located, this is what's there today, the synagogue is there. Uh, the synagogue that stands there today was probably built somewhere in the fourth or fifth century but the, uh, the foundation stones are still there from when Jesus was there, and the, the building is still uh, erected on that foundation. And that's where some of these events take place that we look at. The second thing is Peter's house. Uh, it's been excavated, and a church building has been built over top of it. And uh, it's a place where they believe Peter and his family, and it, they believe the, the house was expanded upon and just kind of in layers, just spread out in kind of a, an octagon shape to uh, take care of uh, other family members, to take care of the apostles. That's where Jesus stayed. And is also believed that the church met there as well uh, in the first century. And uh, this is kind of another view of it. The uh, Peter's house would be on the left. It has a big round church building built over top of it. Uh, the synagogue is on the right, and that's where uh, the things take place that Jesus uh, takes uh, starts out with here in this chapter. So uh, let's look at some things concerning this. Uh, the authority and power of Jesus. Notice in verses 31 and following, it says, Then when he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths, and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was one of authority. We find the authority and power of Jesus, first of all, seen in his word. He taught with authority. If you drop on down to verses 43 and 44, and he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, because for this purpose I've been sent. And he and was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. Jesus was one who preached. We see his authority. We see him teaching. When he preached the Sermon on the Mount, we know that the people responded in a way that was much like this. In the book of Matthew chapter 7, we find the last two verses of that chapter. 
And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings, the Sermon on the Mount, that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. During the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus was preaching, he had these words to say back in chapter 5, verse 17, when he talked about his authority and what he was, how he considered the scriptures. He said, Do not think that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. So Jesus talked about the authority of the scriptures and how that they need to be respected and considered authoritative. So Jesus was one who uh, is talking about this authority. As Jesus spoke in the synagogue in Capernaum and taught these people, they were astonished with the things that he had to say. They were impressed with what he had to say. Notice that man's teachings and man's opinions are not considered here as authoritative. But what is considered authority here is the Word of God. It's what God has to say. And our think-sos and our opinions really don't matter. So he taught with authority. He emphasized the preaching of the Word. And so we must do today. He emphasized the authority of God's Word and the need for obedience. He preached to them and then expected them to listen and to obey. Jesus always expected obedience to his word. And then he uh, had this mission in mind. He said he came to preach the gospel. When we think of people with uh, authority, in Luke chapter 4, verse 43, it says, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also. They wanted him to stay there. They enjoyed the fact that he was healing all of their sick, and they just wanted him to stay there and, and spend that time with them. But Jesus said, I've got a mission, and my mission is to go and preach the kingdom of God. Jesus had a mission, and he was wanting to carry out that mission. In John chapter 7, when the soldiers were told to, to go and to arrest Jesus and, and bring him back, they didn't. And they were questioned, why didn't you bring him back? And in John 7 verse 46, their response was, no man ever spoke like this man. Jesus was the one who spoke with great authority. And he's the one that we need to listen to today. So Jesus taught with authority. The second thing we can notice from this particular passage is Jesus cast out demons with authority. Now notice some of the, the things that are said here in Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 33. Now in the synagogue, there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him, him in, the, in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. And they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him went into every place in the surrounding region. That particular account, this man came, uh, oddly enough, he came into the synagogue where Jesus was teaching. Uh, a man with an unclean spirit, uh, a demon, and demon possession happened back then. It was real. It wasn't a mental condition. It wasn't a disease. Uh, it, it wasn't something like that because Jesus healed diseases, but he also cast out demons, and they're two separate things. So Jesus uh, confronted this man, or this man confronted Jesus, and Jesus talked not to the man, but to the evil spirit in the man, to the demon in the man, and told the demon, you come out, come out of him. The demon uh, recognized who Jesus was. The demon uh, understood that this was Jesus of Nazareth. He recognized his humanity, but he also recognized his divinity when he says, you are the Holy One of God. So he recognized both, the, the demon recognized both sides, but Jesus didn't want something from the demonic world, something from Satan's world, telling the world who he was. He wanted to tell the world, and he wanted his apostles and followers to tell the world who he was. So he told the demon to be quiet. You know what the demon did? 
He obeyed Jesus. You know the second thing that Jesus said to this demon? You come out of that man. You know what the demon did? He came out. Jesus spoke with authority and he had power over the demons and the demons did exactly what Jesus told them to do. Uh, on different occasions that happens as well. If you drop on down to the uh, latter part of the chapter in verse 41, and demons also came out of many crying out and saying, you are the Christ, the son of God. And he rebuking them did not allow them to speak for they knew that he was the Christ. So Jesus had the ability to cast demons out. And this, this picture perhaps depicts a little bit of what it was like when, when this man uh, was freed from the demon and was welcomed into the synagogue there. So Jesus was one who had the power to cast out demons. It's interesting to me that uh, demon possession was something that was very prevalent during the time of Christ. Only two times in the Old Testament it occurs, one time with Saul and then one time with the prophets of Ahab. And then only two other times in the New Testament, aside from Jesus, aside from the Gospels, two times in the book of Acts. You remember the little uh, servant girl in Philippi in Acts chapter 16, and then also the sons of Siva in Acts chapter 19. But Jesus has the power to remove those demons, and he told them to come out. In like manner, even though we don't have demons today, we are certainly influenced by Satan and by sin. And Jesus has the power to get that sin out of our lives. When we choose to believe in him, to uh, repent of those sins and kick those sins out, Jesus has the power to forgive those sins. And when we are coming to him in primarily, or first of all, in baptism, baptism washes those sins away. And then secondarily, as we live the Christian life, the blood of Christ continually cleanses those sins Oh, what a joy it is to know that Jesus has the power and authority to forgive those sins. What a true blessing that is. So Jesus taught the word with authority. Jesus cast out demons with authority. And the third thing we can learn from this passage is that Jesus healed the sick with great authority as well. Look in verse 38. Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house, but Simon's wife wife's mother was sick with a high fever and they made request of him concerning her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever and it left her and immediately she arose and served them. This is Peter's mother-in-law. I'm not going to make many comments on this, but Peter was married uh, and Peter had a mother-in-law. And uh, that's just a kind of a thing we need to understand. But uh, Jesus healed the sick here with authority. Here was uh, Jesus coming to uh, Peter's house, and we saw a picture of where that uh, was back in the first century, and we see Peter coming there. Uh, Mark tells us in Mark chapter 1 that Jesus took her by the hand and lifted her up. And Luke focuses more on what Jesus said, how that Jesus rebuked the fever, and that has to do with authority. Luke, being a doctor, also mentions it was a high fever. It was something that wasn't just a, a little fever. It was something that was uh, very, she was very, very ill. And yet Jesus had the power to completely heal her instantaneously, completely without any recovery. She, she didn't have to go to rehab and she didn't have to spend some time uh, in recovery. She was healed immediately and immediately upon being healed, what she did was to get up and to serve those that were there. She was one who understood the importance of, of once I'm well, here's what I need to do. Now let's make an application of that to, um, to us today. When we are healed of sin, when, when we kick sin out of our lives, when Jesus heals us of the sin sick problem, it ought to be our attitude, I need to serve. Once I, once I understand that I am saved and my sins are, are removed out of gratitude, I need to serve, that I've been freed from those sins, and now I can be a servant as well. Many times, Jesus uh, healed those, and, and we find on occasion when he, he stopped the sea, he had power over nature, he had power over disease, he had power over so many things. And we see him uh, sharing his authority here. Jesus was one who 
uh, we, we see his miracles proving who he was. But uh, let's look a little bit later on in this passage how, what happened. Uh, we find in Luke chapter 4, verse 40, And when the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid hands on every one of them and healed them. So, and here, again, this is separated from the demons because the very next verse says, and demons came out of many, crying out and saying, you are the Christ, the Son of God. So, here were many sick, and it said, uh, Mark's account tells us the whole city came. <clears throat> Can you imagine the whole city showing up at your front door? That's what happened to Peter's house. The whole city came, and they had heard what Jesus was doing, and it's interesting that they waited till after sunset. Remember, this was the Sabbath day. And you weren't supposed to do a whole lot on the Sabbath day, but the Sabbath day ended at sunset. So at sunset, man, they started lining up all over the place, all around Peter's house. The whole city came out and everyone that was sick. Now, Jesus could have <clears throat> said, well, now I'm going to go to the Father on your behalf and let everyone be healed. And, and everyone would have been healed and that would have been the end of it. And that would have been a whole lot easier on Jesus. But he didn't do that. He took the time to individually, individually, each person. Notice what it says. They brought, him, uh, they brought to him those that were sick with various diseases, and he laid hands on every one of them and healed them. He didn't have to do that. His power could have just completely healed everybody all at once. But he took the time for the individual. He took time for every individual. He laid hands on every, each and every single one of them, and he healed them, gave them their health back, and they went on their way. You might say, well, that, that, they should have been so appreciative. They should have, that should have changed their lives completely. That, have changed, that should have changed the whole city. But it didn't. They wanted him to stay. If you look down in, in verse 42, now when it was day, he departed and went to a deserted place, and the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. Well, we know that Jesus was one who, uh, he, he kind of told it like it was, and we'll find in a minute that he uh, condemned them because of their unbelief. Now, what does all that mean to us today? It means that we're to submit to the authority of Jesus. Number one, because we desperately need him. Those people who were sick desperately needed Jesus. Peter's mother-in-law desperately needed Jesus. The demon-possessed man desperately needed Jesus. And we today desperately need Jesus. We can't get out of this world without him. We can't make it to heaven without him. And we need him completely. In Mark chapter 1, verse 33, the whole city was gathered together at the door. They knew, they knew that they, Jesus had something that they needed. And when we come to the realization today that Jesus has something that we need, we're going to, we're going to make some changes in our lives. When we come to that realization, Jesus has something that I desperately need. And if I'm going to make it to heaven, I desperately need to follow him. Then we'll make some changes in our lives. When we don't recognize the need, then we won't make the changes. We recognize that we truly need Jesus. These people willingly submitted, submitted to the authority of Jesus. They listened to what Jesus had to say because they desperately needed him. I can imagine the gratitude of that demon-possessed man after he was uh, exercised, after that demon was brought out of him. I can imagine the, the, the gratitude that he had to Jesus and how he wanted to follow him. We submit to the authority of Jesus because we desperately need him. Secondly, we submit because of his great compassion and care. He cares for each individual. He went to the cross for every single person, not just for a group of people, not for just, not just the, well, we'll lump the whole world there. But if you had been the only person in the world, he still would have gone to the cross for you. Jesus has great compassion and care. How many times we look at the life of Christ and he, he looked out over the crowd and had compassion on them. Even hanging on the cross, he looked out to his mother and had compassion on her. When he was seeing the people who were hungry, he had compassion and made provisions to feed them. 
Jesus was one who looked out and saw the fields white unto harvest and said, we need to send forth laborers. Why? Because he had compassion on them. His care and compassion was so, so prevalent throughout his lifetime. We see that we must be willing to submit to him because of his great compassion and care. He laid hands on each one, each individual. In 1 Peter 5, verse 7, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Jesus is there for us. We find also that we need to submit to his authority because we need to further his purpose. What was his purpose? His purpose was to preach the gospel, to go to preach to others. Now, you remember I told, them, I told you that those in Capernaum weren't really interested uh, in uh, furthering his purpose. They just wanted the benefit of what Jesus had to offer right then. They were healed, and that, that's what meant something to them. But notice what Jesus had to say in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, uh, we usually go to Matthew 11 and we see the great invitation in verses 28 and uh, following. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. But some verses that led up to that are, are very important. Jesus, uh, in verse 20, begins, uh, he, he says, he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done. Well, we just saw the works done in Capernaum, many works there. Why did he rebuke them? Because they did not repent. The works were done there. The miracles were done. They saw who Jesus was, but they didn't repent. Now notice verse 20, 21. Woe to you, Chorazin. That's a city right close to Capernaum. Woe to you, Bethsaida. That's another city right there on the Sea of Galilee. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Now look at verse 23. And you, Capernaum, that's where Jesus was doing all these miracles, who are exalted to heaven will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you... And we just looked at one day where these works were done. If the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, they would have remained until this day. And you remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah back in, in the book of Genesis, how that they were destroyed. Well, he said they would have been spared if, if, if I'd have done these works there. They would have been spared. But I say to you, verse 24, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Well, that was quite a, a rude awakening. This great city, this city where Jesus lived, was his, basically his home base uh, during his ministry. The home of Peter and Andrew, the apostles. A great fishing area where they would, on, on the Sea of Galilee. And now we see Jesus saying, woe to you because the many works were done there, but you didn't repent. You saw who I was. You saw how I acted. You saw how I treated you. You heard my teaching and my preaching, but you didn't repent. And he says, woe to you. When we think about this, we see Jesus willing to carry on his mission. He said, I've got to go somewhere else. If you go back to Luke chapter 4, in verse 43, he says, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also. Because for this purpose, I have been sent. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. Galilee would be a region. There would be several cities with several synagogues there. And that's where Jesus went. We see our importance there. We see our uh, seeing the Great Commission go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. That's our obligation. Go ye therefore and teach all nations and Including, he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Mark chapter 16, it talked about being baptized. Uh, you, he who is baptized shall be saved. Well, who, who believes and is baptized shall be saved. So we see how that all ties together to Jesus' mission. And then we are to go to the world. And we see Will and Emily and others going to various parts of the world. And we see you who are here today going to various parts of, of McNary County. And, and reaching out to others who, who need the gospel. That should be our mission. What did Jesus do after all that? Well, I don't know how long it took. They started, the, the whole town gathered outside the door. It started coming to him at sunset. 
I don't know how long it took to lay hands on everybody that was sick in that city. It may have taken a while for Jesus to, to accomplish that mission, but evidently he got a little bit of sleep, and according to Mark's account, he arose early in the morning, Mark chapter 1, he arose early in the morning, went off to a mountain to pray. We find here in Luke's account, it says uh, in verse 42, now when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place, and Mark tells us he went there to pray. So Jesus was, got a little bit of sleep, winding down for some alone time. That's what he needed. That's what he wanted. And we see how the people responded. They came looking for him, said, we will come back, come back. We need, we need some more miracles. We need you to stay with us. He said, no, I've got other work to do. I've got some preaching to do. I've got some teaching to do. I need to share the good news of the kingdom. And that's what he wanted to do. That, my friends, is a day in the life of Jesus. What a day. Jesus, in his ministry, probably near as we can figure, about three and a half years was spent before he was crucified. During that time, probably somewhere over 1,200 days, probably 12, 1,260 if you go exactly three and a half, 12, over 1,200 days. And we've looked at just one day in the life of Christ and what a difference he made in so many people's lives. That one day on the cross that concluded his life here is the one day that can make a difference in our lives today because of what he did then and what he can do for us today. Jesus can make a difference. One day. We all know the importance of one day. How that one day can make a difference in your life, either good or bad. One day when you, you met that, that person that makes a difference in you, or maybe a day when something happened that was very uh, disastrous in your life. But one day can change your life. And we would hope that this one day, this one day today, can be the day that will make a difference in your life. That you would respond to heaven's invitation. That you would come to Jesus that you would come in faith and turning from your sin and making the confession of faith that you believe in Christ as the Son of God and then to be baptized or immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. It'll be a day that will be, be, make a difference in who you are from here on out. It puts you in a right relationship with God. It may be the fact that even having done that at one time, perhaps you were like these folks and, and you just... you quit believing or you quit following him. It's time to come back and start over. Make today the day that makes a difference. It may be the fact that you are going through a, a struggle right now, a difficult time, and you just need someone to pray for you, someone to pray with you. And we would encourage you to make that known as well. Typical day in the life of Christ. I don't know what all of his other days were like. We just have a record of a few of those days compared to the number of days that he ministered. But here's one day, and in this one day, we see his power in preaching, his power in getting rid of demons, and his power in healing those who were sick. And he did them all with great authority. And his, his word, his authority, will judge us in the last day. And that authority says today, Come to me, you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest.